All right, we're going to go over to cross product now. Um, dot product was 13.3 and cross product is 13.4, just so you know. So again, we have this premise that V is this vector, V1, V2, V3, and W is this vector, W1, W2, W3, I, J, K. So let's talk about how the cross product works and what results we can expect from it. So the cross product is, or what does it do? It finds, this is really cool, it finds a vector perpendicular to both vectors. Finds a vector perpendicular to both vectors, in this case, V and W. Now this particular graph isn't labeled with V and W, but that's okay, I'm gonna label it. So instead of putting A there, I'm going to put the vector V, and this is my vector W. And there's some angle theta between it, and theta isn't necessarily 90 degrees. It's just some angle that the two vectors have between them. And when I do the cross product, I get a vector that's perpendicular to both. So technically, that's perpendicular there, and then it's also perpendicular here. Um, this would be considered... V cross W. All right, what else happens here? Now I set it up there, but let's take note of it. If I write this on a piece of paper, I say V cross W. Okay, that's how I pronounce it. I'm not going to say V times W or V X W, it's V cross W. Now, V cross W has uh, two formulas, kind of like dot product. So V cross W is equal to the magnitude of V times the magnitude of W times the sine of theta. Now, the dot product was cosine of theta. This is sine of theta. Um, and this is a scalar, this number right here. I don't want a scalar. What I really want to do is make it a vector. So I m multiply that scalar to a normal vector that's normal to um, V and W. Now the vector N can go two ways. So if I have a vector V and I have vector W, I can have N going this direction or N going down this direction. And we have to kind of determine which way N is going, up or down, and it depends. So what does it depend on? The direction of N, make sure you can see this, depends on whether we're finding V cross W or W cross V. Now you notice that it's, this is basically, if this is N, this is technically negative N. So I would say that the cross product is not commutative as a result of this. Commutative is not commutative. Because if I'm getting two different vectors pointing in two different directions, then these cross products can't be equal. We are going to do something called the right hand rule in class. It'd be very difficult to do it on this video unless I'm standing up and standing in front. I can't do that quite yet. So we'll do the right hand rule in class because it'll be funny. It's fun. Haha, <laughs> it's active, active learning. All right, so let's talk about how we calculate the cross product. Well, besides using this formula, which it's kind of a weird formula because this vector n here, um, this, this number here has a particular geometric value to it, but then when you have to put it in front of this vector, it's kind of weird. So we have a, another formula to cal calculate the cross product. Now this is a determinant of a vector. So the first row is i, j, k. The second row are the components of v because v comes first. And the third row are the components of W. 
And then we find that determinant and that gives us a new vector that is perpendicular to these two vectors at the same time. I'll show you how to do it, don't worry. If you know how to do determinants, that's great, but not many of you do. You can't do this in your calculator, unfortunately, so I have to show you and I will do that eventually. But last but not least, cross product is always a vector result, always. This is the biggest issue that students have between these two. One's a scalar dot product and one's a vector cross product. Uh, you just kind of have to do enough that you remember it. That's on page 711 if you want to read about it in your textbook. All right, and you should be reading the things that I tell you to read in your textbook. All right, a lot of students think that I'm just going to watch enough videos, I'll learn everything, but part of learning is learning how to read something. So make sure you look at your textbook. I know it seems old fashioned, but you, a lot of people, a lot of studies have shown that when you read something from a book, an actual book, not a Kindle or your computer, it actually helps your brain remember it in stronger ways. All right, let's do some special notes. So um, if I drew this parallelogram, here's V and here's W and there's some angle in here. It's not right angle. There's just some right angle, theta, and I draw a parallelogram like this. The area of that parallelogram is the magnitude of V times the magnitude of W times the sine of that theta that's between the vector V and W. Now this is a scalar, right? If you take a look at this formula, I told you that that's a scalar and we multiply that scalar times this uh, normal vector, okay? But if I just look at the scalar, what that actually represents is the area that the two vectors create in that parallelogram, the whole thing. It's kind of neat. Um, let's remember that this is going to be a scalar as is. And this is actually uh, very easy to prove why this is giving me the error of a parallelogram. So I'm going to kind of take another sheet of paper here and turn it over and show you why it works. It's very quick. Okay, don't panic. All right, so if I take a parallelogram and I want to find its area, well, let's make a better looking parallelogram. Let's not do that parallelogram. All right, let's try another one. We got to make it actually look like a parallelogram. There we go. There's a parallelogram. The area of a parallelogram is base times height. Okay. So the height of this parallelogram, we usually just go from the top straight to the bottom. So there's the height, but I can also put it right here, correct? Now, if I add, put my vectors on there, that would be my vector V, and then my vector W would be right here, and then the angle theta is right there. So uh, the height, well, let's do the base. The length of the base of my rectangle actually is the length of vector W, also known as the magnitude of W. So that's my base. So the area of my parallelogram so far is the magnitude of W. Now, if I want the height, I think about this length here and I want the height here and I have a theta. So what relates the opposite side to the hypotenuse? Well, that's sine. Now the length of this side, if that's the vector V, then the length of it is the magnitude of V. So then my height, uh, let me write it up here. My height will be equal to, let's see, um, let's see. Well, let's try it this way. Sine of theta equals opposite over hypotenuse. So if I solve for H, I just multiply both sides by V, magnitude of V. So the magnitude of V times sine theta gives me the height. So that's what I'm going to put right here. The height is the magnitude of V times sine of theta. That looks familiar. It should. There it is. Very easy to prove and very easy to understand. 
Another special note is cross product is in 3D only. Now I think you can do it in higher dimensions, but it only really makes sense. Its outcome geometrically makes sense in 3D. And then I want you to take a look at the properties on pages 712. 713 and 714. Again, it's the stuff that's in the boxes. So take a look at that before you start doing the problems.